This is the R Podcast, Episode 3, Basic Interaction with R. Welcome to the R Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Nance. Thanks a lot for tuning in, and for those of you who are new to the show, welcome. And for those who have listened to the previous two episodes, welcome back. This podcast is aimed at users who are new to statistical computing, and or those who have experience with other statistical computing software, who want to learn how to use R for innovative data analysis. In today's episode, we are going to look at a set of basic interaction with R. First, I wanted to address a couple housekeeping items and then, and some news updates, and then we'll get to some brief listener feedback, and then we'll get to the main topic of today's show. So first, there are a couple key pieces of news in the R community that I wanted to share since we recorded the last episode. The first of which is that there is a new version of R available. This version is 2.14.2, and it is mostly kind of a bug fix release, not really any major features this time. But with that said, it's always good that kind of, you know, if you have a previous installation of R, if you're like me, you always like to get the latest version once it's available. So in the show notes for today's episode, I'll put in a link to the release notes for this latest release. Another key piece of news that came out was that there has been a new update to the very innovative graphical package called ggplot2. The new version is 0.9, and it introduces a lot of new features that will be very helpful um, for those who have have experience with ggplot2, and more importantly, there have been a lot of improvements in the documentation for the various functions that should help a lot of new users get up to speed with using ggplot2. And as I mentioned, I believe in previous episodes, this this um, is a very innovative graphical package developed by Hadley Wickham, and he's really gotten a lot of assistance now with some of our, of our developers in the R community to really enhance, like I said, the, the documentation with ggplot2 as long as just another really nice code optimization features and many other new features as well. So I'll have a link in the show notes to some very nice posts that have been written up, one in particular by David Smith at the Revolution Computing Blog, which has a really nice snapshot of the new features and links to more information. The rest of the updates I wanted to mention pertain to the R podcast itself. So starting with this episode and future episodes, we're going to actually start looking at some R code to help explain some of the various concepts. So the code for this particular episode and also future episodes will be available on the R Podcast GitHub page. For those who have not heard of GitHub, it's really in turn, it's got a slogan, social computing, so, or social coding, I should say. So it's really become a really nice way for users to really collaborate on development of code for all sorts of different um, R or all different uh, computing packages. And R has really taken off as one of the languages that a lot of people are starting to use um, as far as you know sharing the development of code and more importantly collaboration in general. So we are going to host all the code that will be discussed on the R podcast on our GitHub page. And you can get to that. We'll have links in the show notes, but it's at github.com slash the Rcast. And note that the Rcast contains a lowercase r in this. So when you go to that, you're going to see repositories of the different, uh, or repositories are in essence like groups of coding that kind of belong together. So you'll see a repository for this particular episode. It's going to be called Basic Interaction with R. You'll also see I have a couple other repositories there that are just more of me kind of testing things out. 
as I'm admittedly a little bit new to version control and, and Git in general. And I'm really making a lot of progress to learning how beneficial these features are for, you know, a statistician like me who likes to develop a lot of code for various projects. And you'll see me discuss in future episodes the importance of version control for statistical analysis. And it's really making my life a lot easier to keep track of things that I change. So I'm really looking forward to discussing that in more detail. The other update um, related to the site is that starting with this episode and occasionally throughout the duration of remaining episodes, this will this episode will have an actual screencast to accompany the audio portion of this episode. In fact, to be more specific, it's just going to contain the audio from the main segment of today's episode. I'm doing this as for a couple reasons. I think it is pretty beneficial as we talk about interacting with R to kind of see how things work, so to speak. And also, I'm really kind of testing out my method of recording screencasts to see how if everybody is able to access them correctly, and more importantly, just get your feedback as how I've done this, and then if there are any suggestions for improvement, or even if you like it, I'd really appreciate you letting me know via, you know, audio feedback or an email at the rcast at gmail.com. So I'm really looking forward to see how this works, and hopefully it will be a really nice companion in the situations where I have future episodes in, in which, you know, a visual will really be nice to accompany the audio portion of the episode. So the way I'll do this is I'll have a separate post that will have the actual screencast and you'll be able to play the screencast directly from the website. I'm actually hosting on a service called Vimeo, which is a kind of like a YouTube type service. And it'll have an option for you to play the video in full screen, which is actually what I would recommend as you're going to see some actual code and it might be easier to read. And I'll also have links to directly download the episodes too in a couple different formats. So, as far as, if, for those of you who have not really downloaded these kind of things before, a really nice cross-platform video and even media player in general that I recommend to those who have not really played these kind of things from a download is called VLC. And that's been really nice for me to use personally, as, as I mentioned, it's cross-platform. And it would be really nice for playing the episode, the screencast that I'll record for this and future episodes. So, like I said, I'm really curious to see what you think, and hopefully it'll be a positive result. So now, with that, I'd like to get to some pieces of listener feedback. Message for you, son. Our, pre- our first piece of listener feedback comes from Philip. Philip writes, Hi, Eric. Today, I listened to the second episode of your R podcast. Thank you very much for starting this project and sharing your experiences with R. In the middle of the episode, you said that the ugly GUI is available on Macs and Windows, but not on Linux. This is not true. You can start it by adding a parameter when starting R. So instead of typing R in your terminal, you'll have to type R dash dash GUI space TK. But since there exists such great IDEs, like you mentioned, or maybe because Linux users are more comfortable with a terminal, this option is not widely known. Greetings from Germany, Philip. Well, thank you very much, Philip, and it's nice to start having a real international audience for the R podcast. Thank you very much for that correction. It's amazing that in all my time using R, especially on the Linux and Unix platforms, I was unaware of the existence of the standard R GUI on those, on those platforms. I did try this out uh, from your, from your tip, and it does seem pretty similar to the Windows R GUI, although it seemed to me it did have less menus. And I do agree with you. From my experience, it seems that most users of Linux are either using R from the command line or they're using more established and powerful 
IDEs, like I mentioned Emacs, and I didn't mention previously, but even the VI and VIM editors have a capacity of running R as well. And as I mentioned before, R Studio is really becoming a really nice full-fledged IDE for R as well. But I'll definitely add your tip on starting the standard R GUI on Linux and Unix in the show notes for this episode. So I wanted to thank you again very much for that correction. I do appreciate it. Our next piece of feedback comes from Charles. Charles writes, Eric, I've listened to the first two podcasts and I have enjoyed them both. You have an easygoing conversational speaking style, which makes for a pleasant listen, and you're, you appear to have done your homework. I appreciate the information you conveyed about installing R in a Linux OS environment in the second podcast. You covered areas that I have not seen addressed before anywhere else. I look forward to future episodes. Thanks for your initiative on this. Regards, Charles. Well, thank you very much, Charles. I definitely appreciate you know, your feedback, especially as I potentially dive into some issues that perhaps have not been as discussed formally in either the R blogging community or just within the R community in general. And as I mentioned in the outset, I am quite a fan of the Linux operating system as it has a lot of features that actually I'm also a fan of R about, mainly it's free and open source heritage. So Throughout the remaining duration of future episodes, don't be surprised if you see me put in some little tidbits about Linux here and there, as I feel it's a very nice operating system, and I definitely want to get the word out that it's really an attractive feature in the face of other operating systems. So thanks again, Charles. Our next piece of feedback comes from Atma. Atma writes, Hi, Eric. This is Atma, a grad student of geography at the University of Northern Iowa. I found your podcast through an Android app called Double Twist. I liked your first episode and listened to both episodes in one go. I I listened to several podcasts while I walk to school and also while I drive. I am a fan of open source software and I have been using Ubuntu since its 8.04 version. I appreciate your effort, and thank you for the same. I am new to R, and I would like to learn along with your podcast. I like some of the wrappers for R that give it a GUI. I like the fact that you have a corresponding web page where you host corresponding URLs and help materials that you mention in the podcast. I just have one suggestion, but I'm not sure if it's sensible. If possible, can you shorten the length of the podcast from half hour to say 15 or 10 minutes. That way I can retain all the useful information you say. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot, Atma. It's rather ironic you say that because now I realize I'm already pushing 12 minutes into the podcast, but I definitely appreciate your feedback on the length of the podcast. You know, it's really something I'm trying to find a good balance for. There's going to be some topics that are going to require more time than usual, but I am trying to minimize the time for discussing the main topic in each episode to somewhere between 15 and 20 minutes, give or take, especially early on as we progress through some of the basic concepts of R. And I'm obviously very glad you're able to find the podcast. It sounds like a very interesting uh, application that you're able to find it with. And, you know, like you, I've also been listening to podcasts for quite a while, and actually I started listening listening to podcasts in graduate school as well. And it was really a nice way to pass the time and either the long commutes back and forth or just, you know, walking around campus. And it's kind of like a great way to learn things. And hence, I'm hoping that the R podcast can, you know, pass on a similar concept to people as well. And you mentioned those nice wrappers to R. And in a future episode, I probably will discuss those wrappers such as R Commander and Deducer which are more of a GUI in the sense of there are menus to access certain functions and perform certain tasks, which can be a nice way for those who have experience in software, you know, for example, SPSS, where almost everything's driven by a menu, although it does have command line stuff as well. It's a kind of, those things are kind of a nice way for people to get familiar with R from that type of environment. So we'll definitely kind of take a survey of those in a future episode. 
Well, like I said, thank you very much for the feedback, and I'm really happy that you're listening to the podcast. So I just wanted to definitely remind others as well that, first of all, I'm, I really appreciate the email feedback, but also don't forget that we also have the capability for you to provide audio feedback as well. You can do that in a couple different ways. On the main website at r-podcast.org, you'll see a link on the right side with our voicemail number, and also there's a button if you have a Google account that will connect you to our voicemail line for free. So I would definitely, you know, encourage you to start sending some audio feedback too. I think that would be just a nice way, in case some of you are bored of hearing my voice all the time, to really kind of shake things up a bit. And then also, you can record your own audio feedback using, say, a standard microphone and save it as an audio file, like, say, an MP3 or an OGG file, and you can just send that directly via an email to the rcast.gmail.com. So like I said, I really appreciate the email feedback I've been getting. And I just want to remind everybody that we definitely would like to hear the audio feedback as well. So thanks again. With that, I think it's ready to get to the main topic, basic interaction with R. So here's our discussion on basic interaction with R. What you see, and this is the portion where we're also recording the screencast, so what you see when you start up R, no matter which platform you're running, is a variation of what's called the R console. So what you see here is you see some text that's already been printed that has the version of R, some copyright information, etc., and some some ways you can look at so the contributors of R and etc. So once that text is finished, you'll see this prompt on the on the console window it looks like a greater than sign. So this is the part where the R console is expecting you to type certain commands. So let's go ahead and start you know experimenting with R because at a, at a basic level. It could be used as, say, a really nice calculator. So for instance, I can just type, say, 2 plus 3, and then I hit the Enter key on the keyboard, and now you see 5 has showed up. Of course, what you also see is this bracket 1 close bracket next to it. And we'll kind of get to why you see that in a little bit. Um, that'll have to do with the way the R prints things and all of our details. So that's just obviously a very simple addition, but also R has some built-in kind of constants as well, so we can do some more mathematical things. So while this next example I'm about to show is not really statistical in nature, I just want to illustrate a couple concepts here. So as we know from, say, elementary geometry, the area of a circle is simply pi times radius squared. Well, R, luckily, has that constant pi built in. So if we were just doing a simple exercise of finding the area of a circle with radius 6, all we would have to do is just type the constant, or the letters pi. This is going to tell R to use that pi constant. And then because we're multiplying by the radius squared, we can just simply then put 6 and then to the power of 2, close parenthesis, and then hit enter. Well, you see that that area is about 113 centimeters squared. Okay. Well, what I wanted to illustrate there is that obviously R can do these mathematical operations, you know, using, you know, very typical notation, just like a basic calculator. Now, it's it's important that you be able to interact with the console as obviously that's the way R knows what you want to do to run certain commands. But there's obviously a little, it would get a little tedious to always just enter your commands in here kind of one at a time because it would be kind of difficult to reproduce that later on, especially if you want find yourself doing similar commands for various projects. So with that said, it's pretty important that you look at developing what's called an R script file 
that you can actually build in all of your commands and then ba basically run those into the R console. So you'll see I'm going to show a basic session code. And like I said, this code will be available on our GitHub repository page and you'll have a direct link in the show notes. So I wanted to show then what kind of walk through what this basic code would look like. So you'll see a bunch of text at the very top and notice how each of these lines up here start with a hashtag or a pound or a pound sign, let me call it that. That's the way for in your actual program code to denote comments. So as long as you start your line with at least one of those symbols, then the rest of the the, the code in that line will not be actually interpreted by R. It'll just simply be printed as nothing. So I like to put some information about the script I'm creating at the very top of the script window or the, the script file. So as you see, I've already put in kind of those commands. I just put in the R console in the, in the previous demonstration. So if, when you're typing these kind of commands in a script file like this, in order to pass them on to the R console, no, there will always be a functionality if you're using a various one of the various GUIs to do this. So in the screencast, you're seeing that I'm using a R Studio to see this script file. And there are what you can do is just simply highlight then the portions of the code you want to run, and just hit the run button up at the top of this pane of the session code. And then you'll see I just did that two plus three code again, and then I'll put it five at the R console. So that's just a very easy way to then run your commands from the script file to the R console. And the basic R GUIs also have similar ways of doing this as well. I believe they have a keyboard shortcut of control R on the Windows version to do such a thing. So with that, we've just shown some really basic high-level mathematical type calculations. So let's start looking at how we might do kind of some basic data analysis. So you can create a series of, let's call it numbers, if you will. And for this example, let's say we have six GPA scores from high school students, for example, here in the U.S., so the way you kind of put things together in R, especially like these various numbers in this example, is using a function. And this function is called C. Now, let me step back here for a bit. What you're going to learn about R is that basically everything that you do with R is via a function. Sometimes it'll be less obvious than other times, but basically... R interacts with different what are called objects via these functions. So what you'll see here is that I have this this function called C. So the way I write this is C parenthesis. Then all I've done is I type the different GPA scores with a comma in between each of the scores. So I have like 3.67, 3.95, up to say 3.18. Then I close that parenthesis, and then this would be my vector. That's going to be a term we define later on. A vector of data here, just of six numbers in this case. So if I just run this line, then all I'm going to see is the R console has basically repeated what I typed here. And again, you see that bracket one after I put the command in, and then the actual number is just separated by a space. Now, the, there's kind of a problem with this, is that I've entered these this vector, if you will, with this C function, but after I entered it, it's like I can't really do anything with it. So the, the other important concept, as you're beginning R, to realize is that the power, the capabilities of R are really through what are called objects. And when we say an object, an object is really can be just about anything in R. And for example, we can create an object, we can call it X, that will actually house these 
different numbers, in this case, these GPA scores, so that we can do things with it later on. So the way you can kind of what's called assign different objects to different kind of notation, or in this case, a different object called X, is using one of two ways. You either use what's called the assignment sequence, which looks like literally a less than sign followed by a hyphen. It's kind of like a little arrow pointing left, if you will. Or you could also use the equal sign to assign this vector of GPAs to an object that we're going to call X. Now, before I go much further, if for those of you who are listening who have already experienced with R, you may wonder kind of which side of the fence I fall on as far as which of these sequences to use. So there's actually some cases, very specialized cases, where if you use, say, the equal sign all the time in assigning these functions, that it could cause problems later on. However, from my experience, I think for those who are just beginning to use R, will probably not notice the difference between the two. So I'll kind of leave it up to the user to decide which way they would like to, which of the sequences to use. Personally, I'm using the, the formal assignment sequence of the less than sign and the dash, as that kind of helps me keep track of things in my code a little easier. But like I said, most users who are new to R are probably not going to notice a difference between these. So really, you could do this either way. And what I want to show now is that when you run this line, you'll see that we have an object called X. Now, depending on which way you're running R, you may not actually see this yet. But it is in the actual session of your R session. And these objects are all stored in something called a workspace. We'll kind of get to more about that later on in this demonstration. But basically a workspace is kind of like the canvas, if you think of it like a painting, the canvas that holds all of the, all of the art, or in this case, all of the objects. So, what I have now is I have an object called X that has basically the, this vector of GPA scores. Now, when you want to just print the contents of an object, in this case we called it X, all you have to do is just type that object into the R console, the object name I should say, or just in your script, just put that object name and then just simply run that line. When you do that, you'll see now I have just simply that vector of objects, or that vector of numbers, just printed in the R console again like before. But the nice thing is, is that now, because it's an assigned object, we can do a lot of things with it. So for those of you who have also installed R Studio, one nice thing about that IDE is that in the upper right panel, if you will, there are four panels of areas here. Um, you'll see that in this upper right panel, we have a tab called Workspace that has now that object X printed as, say, a line under this value heading. And it also gives you some information about the object. In this case, it's saying it's a numeric object with six as a, as a bracket behind it. What that means is there are six things inside this object and actually things should be called elements in this case. That's just another formal definition we'll talk about later on. So R has some nice ways for you to simply parse out parts of this object depending on what you would like. For instance, if you want to just get the first element of this vector of GPAs that we created, all you have to do is type the object name, in this case X, followed by a bracket, in this case one, and then close bracket. What this is, is simply telling R to access the first element of the vector object X. So when you run that, you'll see on the R console, you just simply see the number 3.67 printed because that was the first element of this vector of six GPA scores. And you'll see as we dive into more basic concepts later on, there are some really nice functions that we can get various features of these objects. 
and one of those is called length. Length is simply a function that's going to count how many elements in this object that you feed into it that it contains. So in this case, our object is called x. So all you would need to do if you want to just print out how many elements are inside is simply type length parenthesis x close parenthesis. And once you do that and you run that in your session, you simply get six printed, which means that there are six elements. So you've seen now two kind of actual functions used here. We use that C function to put all these GPAs together. And then also we've used this length function to actually count how many scores in this case that we have in that vector of numbers. But really, that's the way you use functions in R, is you simply type the name of them, followed by parentheses, and then what you feed into it is going to depend on the function. But all these functions have what are called arguments, or basically, you can think of that as like parameters that tell the function what to do, and, and also kind of tweak certain features of the function. So... Now we have this vector of GPA scores. Let's say we want to just get the average score. That's a very logical, you know, question. So, like I said in, in R, many things are controlled by functions. So, appropriately enough, there's a function called mean. So all you would need to do is type the word mean, open parenthesis, x, close parenthesis, and then that will actually give me an average GPA score of approximately 3.59. And so the R console basically printed that mean after I type mean X in my script, and then I pass that, that code into the R console. And for those of you who are using R Studio, you can simply use a keyboard shortcut of Control Enter when you put your cursor on a certain line to then run that code into the R console. That's, you know, I, I can, I go kind of back and forth between using the mouse and using the keyboard. So it's nice to have the balance of both window or both ways. Now, I kind of knew off already that there was a function called mean, but let's say I wanted to maybe look at the certain features of the mean function to see if there are any other kind of cool things I could do with it. Well, what's nice about R is that every fun function has a what's called a manual page or a help page that kind of gives the certain details about the function itself. For instance, it'll tell the certain arguments or parameters that it takes. It'll kind of put details around those parameters. Then it'll actually show some example code and in some cases references to other functions as well. So when you want to kind of access this information, this this manual page for each function, you can do this a couple of different ways in R itself, and then I'll show how, I'll tell you how to do this in R Studio as well. There is a function appropriate enough called help. And all you need to do then is to type help, open parenthesis, the name of the function you're interested in reading more about, and then close parenthesis. When you do that, no matter which of the R GUIs you're using, you'll see something pop up, which it actually has, in some cases, a new window with a new page that has the help information for that function. So if I want to see the help for the mean function, all I have to do is, like I said, type the help, open parenthesis, mean, and then when I run that, you'll see, depending on which interface you're using, the help page for what they call the arithmetic mean. So in the default R GUIs, I believe it'll open up as a new window. And in R Studio, what you'll see is in the lower right pane, there is a tab called Help that's automatically been selected. And it has now the information on the arithmetic mean. These help pages are obviously very useful if you have cases where you want to know more about how a function works. Or if you're using a function and getting kind of error messages, it might help you kind of diagnose the issue a little bit as well. Perhaps there's a parameter you're not specifying correctly or something like that. So it's really very important as you're learning R to know how to get access to the help pages for these various functions. Because 
basically every R session that I run, I'm always on a help page one at one time or another because there's just so much information and so many features for these functions. We often need a reference in the case that we want to try something different or just refresh our memory on how something works. So it's nice that R has built-in ways of doing this. So I mentioned that the help function can do this. There's even a more of a shortcut way of doing it where all you have to do is type the question mark and then filed immediately by the name of the function. So I could have done just question mark mean and I would have gotten that same help page as I just got when I typed help parenthesis mean. So let's say another nice feature of R is that on top of these help pages many functions in R have actual examples that you can run that you can or you can actually browse to by using what's called the example function. So we've seen how the help page for mean was brought up with the help function. This help page actually has example code that we can actually invoke directly into our R session by just using the example function. This is another really handy trick to kind of see how functions work. So in my script, if I just type example parenthesis mean close parenthesis and then simply run that command into the R console, you'll see, hold on, I, okay, you'll see that what we have here is in the R console, there is now the prompt has kind of been changed in the output where usually it just didn't have anything, but now in the different lines of output, there's like the word mean and then that greater than sign and then the actual command from the R example. What this is showing you is that this part of the output was from that example code. It wasn't really in your your actual R session code as, as like the stuff you wrote previously, but it's just giving you some nice notation that this code came from the mean functions example. So it's a really nice thing to kind of play with as you get to know certain functions and what you want to and if you want to just see how they work, the example function is really handy for this. So we've seen in kind of the help page and also the example, there is this parameter called trim in the mean function. Well, trim actually lets us tweak how we compute, say, a trimmed mean, which for those of you who may know, that's simply when you remove certain number of numbers from the, the broad list of numbers you're averaging from the different, from if you sorted it from least to greatest, it'll take away certain numbers, a proportion of those numbers from the highest and lowest portion. So it's really a kind of a, that's why they call it a trim mean. You kind of trim the numbers down. So what's nice is with that mean function, we could also do a trimmed mean of those GPA scores where we could trim one out of six or a ratio of one to six and basically trim out one element from each, you know, from the, the least to the greatest spectrum of those averages. So what's nice is in R, there is a parameter in this mean function called trim where you define then the proportion or the fraction of numbers to take away. So what I've done is I can just type mean parenthesis x and then comma and then trim equal and then in this case I'm doing one divided by six or one sixth and that way I can get a trimmed mean of those numbers that were that were remaining after the trim if you will. When I do that you'll see the average GPA was actually quite high is a five and a half which is Actually, it probably doesn't seem right, so I guess something happened there. So this is a case where you kind of need to sometimes tweak certain things. So I'm just going to reassign that number X, as I think what happened is somehow that X got reassigned after that example code. So now, after doing that, I should get a more uh, sensical result, and it turns out I do. Now I get a trend mean of about 3.66. So that was, that was a bit of an accident there, but you see that sometimes you have to really pay attention 
to what the ARC console is telling you, because sometimes you may not get an actual error message, but perhaps something happened after you ran certain code. So what we saw is that the mean function has a way of doing the trend mean, and if you wanted to kind of verify that all worked correctly, you could actually do it in a more of a, um, I should say, more verbose way, where what that trend mean is doing is it's basically sorting that vector of GPAs first, and then it's simply taking away then, in this case, the smallest element and the largest element. So you can kind of do that yourself, and you can see on the code page, on our GitHub page, a way to do that verbosely. And I won't go into that many details here, but my key point of this part of the story is that there's more than one way in R to do almost anything, and it's just a matter of which way you're comfortable with. So we've been talking about the mean a lot, but there are obviously many other statistics you can calculate. And one nice thing about R is that it has various, of course, additional functions to calculate different uh, sample statistics. There is a really nice function in R called summary. What summary actually does is that depending on the type of object you have, it'll give you kind of a different result. And that feature should not be understated enough. It's simply one function, but depending on the type of object you're feeding into it, it'll do certain different things. So if I wanted to do type, see what the summary output is for this vector of GPAs X, I can just type summary, open parenthesis, X, close parenthesis, and then what you'll see if you ran that is you get some nice summary statistics that might be useful if, say, you're looking at the st statistics associated with a box plot and others where it has the minimum, the quartiles, the median, and the maximum. So because this X was this what's called a numeric vector, when I use the summary function on this object, R knew to then just do those basic statistics for that object. But what you'll see later on in the future episodes is that summary will do something different for different types of what are called objects in R. So what we've just seen is just this simple vector, but you'll see later on that there are a lot more other objects that we can do certain, you know, certain analyses with, and summary will do something different for those. Of course, one of the R's biggest strengths is visualization. And actually, with a simple vector of data that we have here, you can simply get a simple scatter plot by using the plot function. That's simply invoked as plot, open parenthesis, x, close parenthesis, and when you run that, no matter which interface you're on, you will either get a new window, or in the case of our studio, a, a visual window on the lower right, where it has simply that scatter plot of, on the y-axis, those x values, and on the x-axis, like the position of those numbers. So in the case of the vector x, I didn't sort it beforehand when I used the plot function. So then it's just simply a scatter at those different positions of the actual points of those GPAs. But much like the summary function, the plot function also will do different things depending on the type of data that are fed into it. Like I said, that's a feature that's one of the key strengths of R is these different functions that can be basically tailored to different object types, but as the end user, you really don't need to know that too much. You can just try these functions out as they are and then see what happens, but there, there have been many things that have been built for us to take advantage of this feature. So that was kind of a snapshot of how to do basic things in, in like using the, what's called the base R. So basically all those functions that are included with your default R installation. But of course, as I mentioned in the previous episodes, one of the key features of R is those add-on packages that have been developed by the R community, which give R basically a whole lot of additional functionality that's very useful. As I mentioned in the audio portion previously of this episode, um, th there has been a revision to that very innovative 
visualization package called ggplot. So if you wanted to install ggplot2 into your R installation, within R, you can do this a few different ways, depending on which interface you're running. But the basic way that works for everything is a simple command called install.packages, and then you put in the parentheses the name of the package you want to install. And in this case, you put quotes around that name of the package. So I could, if I wanted to install the ggplot2 package, I just type install period packages, open parenthesis, quote, ggplot2, end quote, end quote, end parenthesis. And then that will actually trigger the installation process of this package into my R installation. It's really that easy. You don't have to go to a website externally to download it. In almost any situation, you can do this from within your R session itself. Now, for those of you who are running R on the Linux platform, keep in mind that if you do this within your like normal user R session, these, these packages will not be installed in what's called the, the wide site area that all users can access for packages in R. It would be installed in a user directory within your home directory. So if you want to install packages on the Unix or Linux side, it's best to run R as root first and then type your installation commands and then quit that session. That way, if you have multiple users on your R workstation, they will all have access to the package. But I, like I said, for some people, they want to do that. Some people, they're fine with just putting packages in their personal directory. It's obviously up to you. So let's say you've installed the package in your R session. And what's what you have to keep in mind is that R does not load these add-on packages automatically. You have to tell R that you want to start using this. So I already have ggplot2 on my installation. So if I want to start using its functions, I just use what's called the library function, which basically is telling R to go ahead and load the function files, everything associated with this package into my R session. And all you do is type library, parenthesis, then the name of the package you want to load. So in this case, if I want to load the ggplot2 package, I just type library, parenthesis, ggplot2, close parenthesis, and then in the R console, after you pass that, some packages will print certain messages, and some will just print nothing afterwards. It just has, like, the prompt again. Well, that means that the package has been loaded. And if you're running RStudio, one nice thing about RStudio is in the lower right panel, there's a tab called Packages. And when you click that, you actually get a list of all the packages that are, that are been installed at all in your, in your R installation. And for those packages that are loaded, that you can click simply, you can see that there's a checkbox next to the package. And if it's already been loaded, you can see that there's a checkbox after the name or before the name of the package. And if you want to just load a package from this way, all you have to do is just click the checkbox next to a package name, and then it's loaded into your session. What that's doing is simply that same command we just used in the console, the library command to load a package. So it's just one of those nice things that our studio has to kind of make the user experience, you know, pretty easy for all levels of users for R. So I'll wrap up this uh, explanation of a basic R session with this concept of workspaces. So as I mentioned, this workspace is kind of like your canvas of different things or objects in your R session. Well, what happens if you want to, say, quit your current R session but have these things available for later if you want to do some additional work later on. Well, what's nice is R has ways for saving all or even some of these objects into what are called, you know, R data files, which are simply, to be technical, kind of these compressed type files that simply have all of these objects already stored. 
And then in a future R session, you can just load this file and then you can simply have those objects available again without you having to rerun all the code you produce that you wrote to produce those objects in the first place. So I want to demo, I want to talk about a couple ways you can save objects in R. If you want to save everything in your R session, there is a command or a function in R called save.image. And this will simply take all those objects in R and then save it to the file that you specify. So that command, and if I want to save all the objects in my workspace for this session, all I type is save.image, parenthesis, file, equal, and then put in quote the name of the file I want to save this as. So one thing to keep in mind is that this will save the file in what's called your current working directory of R and depending on your OS and depending on you know your session that could be in different areas and in a future episode I kind of talk about more of you know maybe manipulating where you want to store things and where you want to store your code but if I type this in my session this would save this save.image command or this function would save all those objects and if I call it say my workspace all dot r data then that file will then be generated that I can load into a future R session. Now on the another situation you may encounter is that maybe you created some objects you simply don't want to save and you just want to save certain parts of it. Well there's a more generic form called a function called save in which you would type as your first arguments the names of the objects you want to save. So for example, I created that object X of GPA scores. If I just want to save that alone, all I do is I use this save function. So I type save, open parenthesis, X, and then comma. Then I put the file name in the file argument. And then that would save just simply that particular object into that what I call my workspace subset dot r data then that object would just simply be having just that x object it wouldn't have everything like the other r like the other object beforehand did it did have everything in my r session what's nice about things the and now before i go further the r guis also have ways of saving objects as well I believe they have ways of saving just everything again. We're in the default R GUI. You should have a command under the file menu for saving your workspace. And then you can simply browse to an area you want to save it to and then just give it a name. In R Studio, you have the functionality of in this upper right panel, there's a tab called workspace and that's that tab where we could see the actual objects you have an option or you have a button called save where you can then save your workspace as a certain file and then just give it a, a name and then that way you would it's just a simple way of using that save image save dot image command again just simply using kind of a menu driven way of doing it so like i said there are different ways of doing any everything in r basically and depending on which interface you use there are just different things you can do and depending on what your preference is, you might find one way is more appropriate for you than another. So let's say now you want to just quit the quit the session. So obviously one thing you can do is just simply close your window via the usual means in your operating system of closing a program. If you want to do it via a command, it's simply the letter Q and then open parenthesis and then close parenthesis and then that would actually stop your R session. Like I said, it's, again, different ways of doing it, so it's just whatever way works best for you. But that, in a nutshell, covers what I wanted to talk about with this kind of basic interaction with R. And you see, I've done all sorts of different things in this session as kind of a way to preview the, of the topics that we're going to talk about in much more detail in the future episodes. So I really look forward to kind of diving into this, you know, on a more detailed level. But hopefully you'll see from this session that it's really very easy to interact with R 
and that writing these script files is a real optimal way of basically keeping track of the commands you've entered and then the, having it available if you want to tweak those things later on. It's a much more optimal alternative than to simply type everything in the console one at a time where you might lose track of the various things you've done. So as I mentioned, I really look forward to hearing your feedback on this, on this screencast and also this episode in general. So with that, I think we're ready to wrap this episode up. So that was, in a nutshell, what I wanted to cover as far as a basic interaction with R. I hope that you've seen through that code that I demonstrated and I discussed in the episode that really the key concepts about R is that everything is basically controlled via a, a function or a set of functions. And these functions are used to interact with different objects in R to give you different results depending on what functions you're using. And that's why you'll hear R termed as an object-oriented language or an object-oriented programming framework. Now, depending on your background, that may mean different things, but for those that are new to R, just remember that basically almost everything in R can be thought of as an object, and we have different functions at our disposal to do certain things to these objects. And what's nice is there are certain object or certain functions that depending on the type of object will do different things, but we can use that same function on those different objects. We talked about the summary function and the plot function. Those are just two of many classes of functions that have this capacity. And that really makes for some really powerful coding that we can do in our future, in our future episodes. So I really appreciate your listening to this episode and I definitely want to, I hope that you all stay subscribed to our podcast feeds. You can find all those feeds on r-podcast.org. The main feed will have all the posts for, for the R podcast website. And of course we have separate feeds for MP3 and OGG uh, audio formats. And we also have a feed just dedicated to the screencasts themselves. And I really hope you've enjoyed this, this first kind of dive into the, what, what we do to interact with R. And in future episodes, we're going to dive into some more details. For instance, what different objects there are for data types. We'll talk about ways of importing data. And of course, things like visualization will be a very important topic as well. So with that, I think we're going to wrap this episode up. And as I mentioned, please keep passing along your feedback to the R pot, to the R cast at gmail.com. And as I mentioned before, I really appreciate hearing some of your audio comments too. And I'd really be a nice way to keep this, this podcast even more interactive and really get to know all of you in the community. So with that, I think we're going to wrap this up. So until next time. End of line.